Welcome to Equine Assisted World. I'm your host, Rupert Isaacson, New York Times bestselling author of The Horse Boy, founder of New Trails Learning Systems and LongRideHome.com. You can find details of all our programs and shows on RupertIsaacson.com. Here on Equine Assisted World, we look at the cutting edge and the best practices currently being developed and established in the equine assisted field. This can be psychological, this can be neuro psych, this can be physical, this can be all of the conditions that human beings have that these lovely equines, these beautiful horses that we work with help us with. Thank you for being part of the adventure and we hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome back to Equine Assisted World, where we talk to people who are in the world of therapy, therapeutic stuff that is just flat out good for you, working with horses in a way for the body, for the mind, for the soul. What's the cutting edge of this? It's, it's a rapidly developing field. And the point of this podcast is to make people aware of some of the people who are out there really at the cutting edge, doing amazing work with this on the neuroscience end, on the practical end, on the horse welfare end, or putting it all together. So I have today somebody absolutely fabulous. You can always rely on me to find people who are absolutely fabulous. And this is one of them. She is called Terry Brosnan. If you don't know who Terry Brosnan is, you should. Terry Brosnan is in Dublin and she runs the equine program at the Child Vision School, which is in the middle of Dublin. I don't mean on the edge of Dublin with some fields. I mean, in the middle of Dublin with horses, serving kids from poor backgrounds. And it's a school for the visually impaired, which has a really, really, really large collegiate intake. But it's also a school that has large amounts of people with autism, other neuropsychiatric related conditions and physical conditions, some of them quite severe and visually impaired altogether. It's a really, it's a tough job in a tough place. And Terry makes it work, but Terry doesn't just do that. Terry has been somewhat of a newcomer to the equine assisted world, meaning within the last decade. And one of the things which she identified, which I thought was very interesting was that there was a lot of factionalism and a lot of division between the different areas of equine assisted stuff, whether it was path international or RDA or hippotherapy or Igala or horseboy or death, all of which are great things, but they were all existing very much separate from each other and people having an idea that somehow they were in competition with each other, or you should do one, but not the other, which of course is not true all the best practices combine. So Terry really saw this problem and she's one of the few people I've run across who were proactive about it. And I was lucky enough to be sitting in a, in a meeting about three years ago in Dublin, where an idea came up to create an organization called Equine Assisted Ireland, a national association that would put together all these modalities, all these paradigms and to look for the best and look, look, to look for the best practices within them. This then went on to something else rather extraordinary. And this is what I'm going to ask Terry about. So Terry, just introduce her. Who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? I'm, I'm Terry Brosnan. I have grown up around horses and fascinated by the way that we interact with them all of my life. I got the opportunity just over seven years ago to work in a therapeutic setting and to take it on and make it work because it was sitting there, it wasn't quite working and they didn't know what was, why this couldn't work in a situation that had been set up specifically for it and it still wasn't working. And so I came in and one of the big problems that I found was that there was a lack of communication between all of these different groups that were setting themselves up within the equine assisted areas. There was a lot of what we would call here in Ireland snobbery and just difference between groups and a feeling that certain groups were better 
or less than others. From my understanding of it, because I was coming in from the outside, I could kind of see that all of these groups were fantastic. All of them offered really good connections with the people that they were working with. They were all coming from a really good place and all of them wanted to learn more than they currently knew and wanted this practice to move forward. So I think that when I when I see common goals, I'm I'm somebody who kind of goes, oh, well, let's group all these people together and see see where this can go, because we're always better together. We're, you know, human beings, we're better in a tribe. You know, we're always better when we have support, when we're not trying to go it alone. And so I thought, right, if I can get all these people in a room and we can say, actually, look, we have so much to offer each other, we can go so many more places together than we can apart. And that was where the idea was born out of. We have a great relationship with Igala because, you know, their practices are so high standard here. Their 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 people are really well trained and, and fantastic at what they do. And when we looked at the RDA, I, which it is in Ireland, which is the equivalent of PATH or the RDA in the UK, these guys have been working at this since in Ireland, I think since the 70s and the 80s, all with really good backgrounds. They, a lot of these women coming from horsey backgrounds, knowing they're, they're good Irish horses, knowing all these attributes and desperate for more information and not really having a way of connecting in with the wider world and wider developments in equine assisted activities. And, and so bringing everybody together was a way of trying to Establish connections to the likes of Hetty, Ayahayo, the larger organizations where research was being done, where like horseboy, where people could actually just say, oh, yeah, I can see how I can apply this to my work and improve what I'm doing. So that was how we started that. So just for the listeners who aren't familiar with Hetty and Ayahayo, can you just tell us a little bit about what they are? So I'll start with Ayahayo because they're a really interesting organization. They're the International Association of Human-Animal Interaction Organizations. So they look after things like, you know, human-animal interactions with dogs, cats, farm animals, horses. Whales. Everything, everything. And they're interested in studying how humans and animals interact with each other. And they very involved in research and looking at this across the globe. Then I suppose Hetty is the Horses in Education and Therapy International, and they would be a member of IAHIO. They would okay. be one of the members of IAHIO, but they specialize in horses alone. And so they would have originally been made up of the RDA, the Riding for the Disabled Association, PATH International. Those would have been the original founding groups of Hetty. And it has evolved now, and it includes EGALA in various countries. It includes horseboy practitioners. It includes therapeutic riding coaches, OTs, physios. Everybody who's coming into this field can become a member of IFHETI. And they're looking at trying to ensure great welfare for their horses, welfare for clients, and, and a kind of standard, professional standard across the board. And so I, I, I was there with you. That's kind of when I more or less first met you and we were, you were putting forward an Ireland based national association, which has since gained ground called Equine Assisted Ireland, bringing all of these diverse groups together, which I thought was a brilliant idea. And now several years on, I now see that you're doing something else on a national level, which I find intriguing. So what for the listeners, what, what Terry's done? is she, so, she she has well t tell us you involved horse sport ireland right yes she managed to get the sport horse organization which would be the equivalent of the u.s equestrian federation or the british horse society to back a really interesting project with that. so what have you managed to do terry so i think you know we recognize the need for therapeutic riding across every society that we've come across. And what's happening is people are turning up on riding school doors and going, knocking there and saying, hi, can you see my child? 
And the riding instructors that are there have all this horse knowledge. They've learned how to give a flat work lesson. They've learned how to give a lunge lesson, lead rein, jumping, all of this. But they've never learned how to give a therapeutic session. And they didn't have that skill, that toolbox, that skill group. And so Horse Sport Ireland came to us and said, look, we have this demand. We have this enormous demand. How are we going to fill it? How, how can, what can we do? How can we allow the people that are there who have all of this horse knowledge to expand it and have a toolbox to work with children with autism, sensory processing issues, disabilities? All sorts of things. in a regular yeah. riding school environment. In a regular riding school, right? And I guess this would also include people with eating disorders or anxiety or ADHD or just the stuff Trauma, that comes up, right? Everything across the board. So, okay. I mean, they're, they're these people are the type of people who are are knocking on the doors of riding centres all over Ireland, anyway. And there was a huge demand, but no qualified staff. And so, Horse Border Ireland said, "Look, we need to provide." qualified people here how do how are we going to do it and they came to our team and where I work in Child Vision they said look you guys all started as riding instructors you guys all came from a horse background your system is working and you're providing this amazing service so how can we how can we become you how how can we make ourselves how can we provide this information to all of the people around excuse me there's a ghost in the background here <laughs> large dogs but a four-legged one yeah a four-legged one yes so we proposed that we would sit down examine our practices and see what it was that makes writing instructors really good at this work and I think we're uniquely qualified actually horsey people are uniquely qualified because our day-to-day -day colleague is a large non-verbal colleague we work with non-verbal people in inverted commas horses with a lot of anxiety a horse to pray <laughs> absolutely animal. with high cortisol le levels <laughs> so i mean these are our these are our best friends and our and our colleagues every day and so we're used to reading body language we're used to not having to communicate with words and we're used to doing risk assessments on a very very quick basis so we, we have lots of skills within our armor that we can add to, to allow people to really provide good quality, researched sessions that will meet goals for people. Okay. Meet goals for the children and adults that they're seeing and improve lives. So that was what we did. We put together a course, we wrote it over lockdown, and then we, they, they, they came to us and, and said, look, we'll fund it with you if you apply for funding with us we'll we'll go for it we applied for funding we were successful and that financed the setting up writing and rolling out of this course so I, I, last year between actually november 2021 and november 2022 we had had about 50 people on our course but qualified about 35 of them, they all had the right qualifications to get certified within the process. So when you say the right qualifications, does this mean that these were people, for example, who'd already done their BHSAI, that would be the British Horse Society Assisted Instructor, basic level thing, that they had to at least have something like that? Or Absolutely. They had to have some coaching or teaching qualification. They had to have a good horse background. And they also needed, because of the, the, the setup with the Horse Sport Ireland and the Association of Irish Riding Establishments, who really pushed for this to go through, they had to be a member of the Association of Irish Riding Establishments or be an employee of a member of the Association of Irish Riding Establishments. So there's something here that's blowing my mind. I'm used to the large horse associations being closed priesthoods that perhaps act like gatekeepers and this can like any bureaucratic organization make change a slow thing you said that horse sport ireland came to you you didn't go to them that's no. unheard of how, how did this happen 
Well, I think they had, I, I knew a lot of people who are working in the industry, have done all of my life. And they were interested in, when I started into therapeutic writing, they were interested because they know the way my mind works. I need to have facts. <laughs> I'm very logical. I like things to, to progress in an order. And they know that for me, the horse knowledge is where I want to come from. I always want to learn more. I want to interact with my horses in the best way that I can. And I'm not afraid to say there's lots of things I don't know. And I'm always willing to learn if there's a better way to do something. And so we started this. I got a lot of help from people within the organization that I work from. I have an amazing team. Everybody came with ideas. We were lucky enough to be introduced to you, Rupert, and we we absorb, we have a team that absorbs ideas and we will find the best principles and we'll take them and run with them. I am a magpie. I will take anybody else's idea if I think it's good enough and I will run with it. And that's really what happened. We learned a lot very quickly from our OTs, our physios, from the experts in orientation and mobility, disability experts. Learned a lot going back to basics of horsemanship and going, OK, so what can we do? How do we marry this all together? The final linchpin for me was the horse boy experience. So that marries the, the, the two aspects really well together. And it showed me the place of the horse at the center of the work that I'm doing, which really sat well with me. And so when I'm doing something like that, and I'm all enthusiastic. I'll. I'm very evangelistic. I'm I'm talking to everybody about it. So I, you know, I was I was letting people that I knew in the industry know about this the work that I was doing, and they said this sounds just like really good horsemanship, and that's what we want to promote. And you're you're really preserving your horses at the center of the work, and you're doing good work with the clients that you're seeing. So that's what we're interested in. We're interested in coming from a horse perspective. I think the difficulty is for the governing horse bodies around the world is that the horse isn't always the center of therapeutic riding or therapeutic or equine assisted activities whatever or the terminology of sport riding as well i mean or, or of sport riding exactly the and horse is and... often neg neglected as even yes though, yeah yeah <laughs> so so they really are starting to move towards a system where the horse is the center okay and everything else needs to come from that the, you know because if we're looking at having you know, other professions wanting to join us in the arena. They need to have a horse person there. I think the analogy I like to use is, you know, when you're a healthcare professional and you're working with parents, they are the expert on their child and they will tell you all of this amazing information about that child. And they know more about their children's needs than anybody else. And that's equivalent you know, there doesn't make them a professional, a healthcare professional, because if they had seen a thousand children at that level, that makes them a horse care or healthcare professional. Mm. And I would feel the same about horses. Somebody who owns one horse and knows it well may be an expert in that horse, but it doesn't make them a horse professional. Mm. But when you've had hundreds of horses through your hands and working with them on an ongoing basis, that makes you a horse professional. Hopefully you're a horse professional who puts the horse at the center of your work. And I think we need to be really enthused that horse people want to get involved in this because they need to protect the horse and keep it at the center of this work. I want to come in a few minutes to how exactly you are putting the horse first and what are you doing for the horse body, mind, spirit, well-being as part of this work and part of this horse. But before I go there, what's been the response? from the equine, these young equine professionals that you're reaching out to? Because you're basically saying to them, if, if I understand it correctly, look, there's a career path here, whether you do actual therapeutic modalities or whether you want to just be a riding instructor, but knowing that you're going to get these people coming in now more and more with diagnosed 
conditions or maybe undiagnosed conditions, but still needing a more sensitive hand. What's been the response from these people? Because horse people are famously bossy and like, well, they should just get up with it and you know, pull their socks up. And so how, how have you managed to, to get through that bossy horsiness that so many of us were brought up with? I, I, there are two aspects to this. I think the overwhelming response has been relief from people. Interesting. They have been looking for a way to deal with these clients that they're seeing. Either they know and they're being told these clients have autism or ADHD, or they're not told and they're still having to try and put them on a horse and teach them riding without any skill set or toolkit. So on that basis, there was overall relief. And that was added to by the idea that, yes, you already have a huge number of the skills that are required. We're not going to teach you to suck eggs. You know, we're not going to reinvent the wheel here. All of the skills that you have around horses are all valid. And this is how you utilize them better to put the horse at the center of your work. And I think it's really important for, particularly in Ireland, because we're the land of the horse and nobody wants to be talked down to here. We're all very prickly about, you know, we know what we're doing. So <laughs> it leads to that idea of, you know, if you're gentle with people and assume that they're coming from a place of knowledge, they can always ask if they, if they want to fill in any gaps and we leave that space open. But we're saying to them, okay, guys, this is stuff you have. How do you want to evolve it? You know, we're going to give you everything you need. What are you looking for? So we're asking them to feed back into it. And that takes away the bossiness. We all need to be a little bit more curious, a little bit more vulnerable, a little less, you know, on edge when we, when we meet with other professionals who might, it might seem quite threatening. You know, here's somebody going to tell you how to run your life or how to run your horses. And that's not what we're about at all. We're about saying, look, we were curious. We we found this great system and we found other great systems and we've implemented them all together. Or as much of the, the best practice with the human and the best practice with the horse that we could find for various different reasons. I mean, our speciality is visual impairment and it's a very unique slot. And we found all the experts in that. And we, we look at that very particularly. But we have lots to learn from our students as well. And we're not above saying to them, look, what is your experience? Tell us your experience. Bring your personality into the situation. Trust the experts, basically. The experts being the, yeah. the condition. Yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. So I'm going to ask you actually a bit. In a, in a moment about the specifics of working with people with visual impairments and particularly when those visual impairments are combined with say autism or say a, a serious physical condition. But let's talk about this horse welfare aspect. So if you were saying that the horse sport Ireland and then professionals within the horse industry there were reacting well to what you were including in this course for professionals, not just about how you work with people with special needs of one kind or another, but also on how do you prioritize the welfare of the horse in this? Can you tell us a bit about how you do prioritize the welfare of the horse with this? Because you, you're in a unique position there in the middle of the city. Yeah. So there, there's a couple of interesting aspects to this. Yes, we are in the city center. So that means that we actually don't have access to daily grazing. We don't have access to some of the things that in an ideal world we would want for our horses on a day-to-day -day basis. Or that many people take for granted, yeah. Absolutely. Horses and humans live, have, and will always live hand in gel for the last God knows how many thousand of years. So we found a way of prioritizing the most important things, which are our horses' welfare and happiness on a daily basis. Why, why would I be interested in this? Well, originally when I went and, and talked to the guys in Ohio, I, I was talking to them from a horse perspective and a lot of their uh, practitioners were coming from psychological perspectives and working with horses. But 
but not necessarily always from a horse background. And they were really interested to work with people who were just coming from an equine background. And so one of the things that I got involved in early on was a an equine welfare task force, or an equine task force, not just welfare. One of the modules we worked on was welfare and training of the horse and best practices within equine assisted activities. It was a group from all over the world and everybody was coming at it from their own unique perspective. You know, people from South Africa, from Australia, from France, Germany, the States, and everybody's situation was different, but the core tenets of best welfare practice were the same. And so that was an interesting group to work with. And it, 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 it fed into a lot of what I knew, what I'd learned, what I was going to go on and learn. And I'd always been interested in Andrew McLean and Paul McGreevy's work on equitation science. I'd always been interested in how horses learn. And then having worked with you guys in Horse Boy, it's applying that learning to keeping horses interested, keeping them happy, not letting them go stale. Because in Ireland, I don't know, I, I can only speak from my own perspective. We have a situation where we break horses around four years of age. We teach them a lot between four and six, maybe seven years of age. And then we just stop. We stop their education. Mm. Unless they're very in a very tiny number of elite horses that are doing progressing with dressage or eventing, we stop. And it's just so devastating for horses. They are such intelligent beings. They love to learn. And they, they'll learn anything. They'll learn lots of bad habits as well as good habits if you let them. And I think that's inevitably what often happens to to horses in the long run is that they get so bored. They, they learn bad habits instead of... I agree. I mean, the, 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 yeah. a lot of what people say, I think, when they say, oh, this horse is badly behaved or it's just bored and, and that horses are essentially playful animals. And the one thing they're often so often not allowed to ever do is play. And certainly that that play can't come into the working environment. Can you tell us how that, given that you are in these, this really constrained environment, what is your week to week program for your horses that keeps them happy, involved, fit in body and mind that others could follow? What, what, what's your formula? What do you do at Child Vision? Okay, so it's a real mix across the board. There are play times, there's loose schooling. Most of the weekends, we, we don't work on the weekends. We're in a very luxury position with horses, unlike most people. We, we are, our horses are off every weekend. So we encourage lots of loose schooling over our weekends. Loose jumping, a little bit of lunging, but nothing where there's a human on their back if we can possibly get away with it over the weekend. Monday to Friday, then we'll work in hand, we'll work long reins, we'll work lunging, and we will school our horses. We don't have a huge amount of time. We see an awful lot of people. How many do you see? Between 80 and 120 every week. Okay. And we have a, we have a <laughs> staff of, of four at the moment. 80 to 100 people a week, yeah, staff yeah. of four. And you said lunging in hand and long reining during yeah, the yeah. week when you're seeing these 100 people. How do you avoid there being a time conflict between <laughs> what you've got to do for the horse and what you've got to yeah, do for yeah. the people? So this was, this was the really interesting thing working with you guys was just where, how could we find the time? Where would we find the time? Because... It seemed like, you know, you needed time for in hand work. You needed time for this. You needed time for that. And where were we going to see all these clients? So we, we combine the two where, where possible. You know, we give lunch lessons. We'll give in hand work with our clients. We'll teach them how to do it. We'll teach them how to lunch. We will, you know, work with them in long reins. We will in, use side reins and we'll use market harbors. We'll use Viennese side reins to give our horses contact to work into so that they can continue the work that they've done on the lunge or in the side reins as they progress. Around. Oh, that's clever. So you, you, they can build their muscles at the same time as working with the kids. Absolutely, because we ah. don't have enough time to do it outside of session. We have to incorporate that work into when the horses are actually moving. Okay, so you, you, for example, would have an autistic or blind child on the horse while doing the in-hand work with the horse 
Absolutely. And, it gives them amazing feel. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. No, this makes sense. And then do some of your older um, clients who maybe are getting to adolescence, can you bring them in as part of the team? Can you then hand over some of the lunging, long reining and in-hand work to them? Yeah. I mean, we, we would have we would have volunteers and we would have older clients that come in and do work experience with us and volunteer. And we would try and this is not rocket science and there is very little gatekeeping within our organization or our team within the expertise we have. We have this expertise. Do you want to come and learn? Let's do this. You know, we'll give, we'll pitch it at the right volume. We'll pitch it at the right level, but we're not saying you can't do this or you can't learn this. There's far too much of that in horses. It's like, I have this knowledge and you need to give me all your money so you can have it. <laughs> so we try and just say, look, you know, what, what part of this do you want to help us train these horses? Would you like to, to learn how to lunge them? Would you like to learn how to do in handwork? And we keep it fairly basic because, you know, it depends on how we don't want to overwhelm people either. You want to set them up for success and make sure that they're, you're, you're providing them with accurate training that's going to allow them to do the work that, they, that you're doing with them and improve what the situation and make it all happier for them and the horse. From the listener's point of view, I can really attest to this. I had the honor of going to the Royal Dublin show, which is the big Irish horse show. If you haven't ever gone there, you really should. It's one of the great cultural experiences of the world, I think. And uh, I saw you, Terry, and Lucy, Lucy Dillon, your right hand, who's amazing. And yep. David, tell me David's surname again. David Moore. David Moore, that's right. David Moore, who comes from a show jumping background, but is now working in the autism field. I saw you guys do a a demo of the work. And one of the things that I found very amusing was that the horse looked so good that and you, you listeners will get a chuckle out of this. So basically the reason why a lot of people bring their horses stub and shows obviously try and sell their horses, right? So that the horses have yep. to look fabulous, you know, huge top lines, huge muscles that are, and so the, the child, we saw the child vision team go in to do their therapeutic riding demo on horses that looked so good that people came up who had no idea what they were doing and said, oh, which showing class are these horses in? And are they for sale? <laughs> and uh, these were the, like donation throwaway horses that you guys had totally turned around and looked frankly magnificent. And this, of course, I was, I'm not used to seeing in the therapeutic riding world. What do you think we can do or you can or one can do mm -hmm. to get therapeutic places getting their horses into meta horses like this because i saw how these horses arrived with you and they mm, yeah. didn't look like that and then i saw how they were a year later while having been trained and rehabbed while serving the kids it wasn't like you had the time and the luxury to yeah. take them out of work and build them and then you'd done it at the same time what would you say to people who are running therapeutic riding or even just regular riding establishments who are you do have this time crunch to get their horses like this what what's your advice well first of all on a very basic business economic level this is just a no-brainer for me you know up until you know a couple of years ago people are spending money massively on equine chiropractics you're you know you're spending money on spas equine spas you're you're trying to find time to school your horses their your insurance is going through the roof because your horses are switched off and accidents happen when horses are not paying attention and they're not engaged with the people that are working with them so from a very basic economic perspective i have a very low insurance rate i have really good feedback from my clients they love being on my horses and looking at my horse they want to be with them I don't have a big chiropractic bills. I have very small spa and chiropractic bills for my horses because they have good core strength and they are stable. So from, if you leave everything else aside, you know, if I leave all of the therapy. By the way, that's aside, a dog in the background, everybody. Sorry, it is. <laughs> a very, very large dog with high heels on. <laughs> Clip clopping across the wooden floor. 
if you leave all of, if you leave the therapeutics aside, but you were in a horse business and you want your horses to turn out and be, you know, look amazing and behave amazingly and be interested in what they're doing, then the work that we do with them is how that happens. It, what they, as you say, Rupert, they weren't like that when we got them, but putting these horses together not only improves their physical attribute, but they're mentally much more engaged. They really have a trust bond with the people that are working beside them every day. You know, they'll look to Lucy and David and myself and they'll, you know, they'll trust us over whatever is happening on their back which means that we can use them for very compromised kids because they're not listening to this. They're listening. They're not listening to the sky monkey. They're not listening to the person on the back. They're listening to the person at their front, at the side, who's, who's going to mind them and who's the person who puts all the work into them. And so from that basis, it's, it really is a no-brainer. And I couldn't go back to producing horses for anything in a different way because it just wouldn't make economic sense. So for you, the, the, the secret is in the, the playtime, loose schooling, and then also the lunging in hand and, and, in, and long reigning work, yeah. but combining that with the clients. Now, can they come to you and learn this? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're happy, <laughs> happy to teach people what we're, we're doing because it's, I think when you find something that works so well, you want to pass it on. You don't want to keep it to yourself. You want to spread the word. And, you know, we're an open door. People can come in and shadow us. They can come and do courses with us. They can learn about what we do. We're, we're happy. We really are a very open campus because we have nothing to hide. I think that's one of the things as well. It takes away that whole anxiety, you know, People, you know, how do you train your horses? Is there some secret? There's no secret. This is science. This is basic, good horsemanship, teaching your horse new tricks, keeping them engaged, doing with your horses what you would love people to do with your kids, yeah. keeping them interested, learning, moving, supple, happy, engaged. So this is what this sounds like. You, 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 there's some, sounds like conflict resolution to me. So you've got, you've got time conflict resolved. Yep. You've got a seeming conflict between the sport or performance horse aspect and the therapeutic aspect resolved. You've mm -hmm. got, can we have horses in a city versus country seemingly resolved? And also looking for resolution through what you're doing through Equine Assisted Ireland and yeah. the, these courses for young professionals with Horse Sport Ireland. I know that you have a bit of a background in conflict resolution that's a little bit unusual. Would you tell us? Cause it, because I think those stories would really help inform people of how you've managed to come up with this. Rather so revolutionary. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have a brain that is tuned to conflict. I suppose I grew up in the north of Ireland. Uh, between I was born in 1969, just after the trouble started. And I lived there until I was 10 years old, 11 years of age in 1981. Now, just before you go on, not everyone who's listening knows what the troubles were. And that no. doesn't sound like a very big word. <laughs> So it's those a very are... small word to describe an apartheid system. Okay. So in the north of Ireland, there were two opposing factions, um, very divided between what was seen as the Catholic Irish Republican faction and the Protestant Unionist with, that's a union with the UK and wanting to still be part of the UK government and monarchy. These were people who had originally been asked to come and settle the land in Northern Ireland from Scotland, from England. They had been given this land to settle and to organise centuries before. So they were at odds with each other because the people who had come in, been given the land, had taken it off the existing inhabitants. They had 
organized all of the businesses and the economics so that they benefited only and that the indigenous, pop indigenous population couldn't benefit from it. And, and that obviously leads to conflict. However, <laughs> you also have a situation where people have to live side by side. And they've defined a way of, regardless of their internal politics or even their external politics, of finding a way of smiling and nodding at people across the counter in a in a in a day to day situation. And I have great observation skills, so I I spent my childhood watching these interactions and watching people who I knew were in opposition to each other having to go about their day-to-day -day lives in somewhat of a hand-in-glove way and yet being at very opposing ends of the spectrum. But, and it was fascinating how that well, dichotomy That, that makes it sound like sort of village or office politics. This is not what was going on. The, 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 the troubles, for, the, for those listeners who don't know what happened, <laughs> was it erupted into enormous violence. Yes, and, and not, the not British just Army were sent right. in to <laughs> the British Army were sent in to qualm the violence. The, it started with the peaceful marches, people looking for civil rights, effectively. The, um, the Catholics looking for civil civil rights. Catholics looking for civil rights, and the English government going, oh well, we can't have them taking over because the English government had a vested interest in supplying the Unionist population, the the Protestant population with money and jobs and keeping the governing Northern Ireland, keeping it all of their income in the UK tax coffers. And so they said, look, we will support you guys. We'll send in the army to keep the peace in inverted commas. And so in 1969, they sent paratroopers onto the streets of Belfast and violence erupted on a grand scale. Because Catholic people were already living in enclaves and very poor economic and situations. They were at the end of their tether. They could not earn a living successfully. They couldn't get out of the situation they were in because all of, very like apartheid in South Africa, all of the power was in the hands of the unionist population. Tell us about the violence. How did the violence manifest itself? What, what happened? Oh, so yeah, this is a, it's a, it's a thing. It's funny to, to think about it now, it's, there were bombs all the time. There were bomb scares every day. So you might be in a shop and just be asked to leave, put down everything you've, you've done and walk out the door. You got searched every time you went into a public building, any public building. Could be a library, could be a shop, any, anywhere where other people went into the door as well. You could be bodily searched at every entrance to the shop. Your handbag was looked in. Your shopping bags were examined every time you went into a shop. And um, bombs were going off, right? Bombs yes. were actually exploding. Yeah. And killing people. Yeah. People were being kidnapped. People were being shot. People were being disappeared. And it may, it was happening and it didn't always happen so close to home, but it was happening all around you. The funny thing that always springs to mind when, when I talk about this is there was an announcement used to be made around about six o'clock or seven o'clock in the evening. It would just come on in the middle of TV programs on your TV and it would, people would say, will all key holders in a certain area please return to their um, shops? And that was because there had been a firebomb or there had been, there was a bomb scare in the area and, and my, my, father was a business owner, so he would often have to get up, drive back into Belfast, go and open the shop or do whatever was required of him. And people lived like this all the time. Now, okay. So your father was a business owner through, yes. so you, and you were a child through yeah. this thing with bombs going off, people targeting businesses. And yeah. one of the things I know happened was that both sides ended up behaving somewhat criminally. And, yeah. <laughs> and getting protection rackets going where they would go and say, well, we will burn your shop or we'll bomb your shop or whatever, or we'll kill if you. If you don't your, pay us protection money. If you don't pay us protection yeah. money, which we'll use yeah. to sup supposedly for our, uh, our cause, our <laughs> cause, but actually we're going to, you know, use it. Yeah. yeah. What happened to your dad? Was he caught up in this? 
Yes. Yeah, so he had an off license. What's again. an off license for those who uh, are not British? Oh, uh, where you sell beer and wine. A liquor store. Uh, yeah, liquor store. Exactly. Okay. In the States, it's a liquor store. In, 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 in Australia, it's an, uh, an offie. <laughs> uh, so uh, a, a license to sell alcohol off premises. Absolutely. Off, off license. Okay. Off license. And so he had been in the wine trade all of his life, really enjoyed that end, had a bar and restaurant in a, in a village. And he knew instinctively that actually the area that he was looking at to set up this office would be, was a developing up and coming area. And he thought, I know that needs an off license. And he was right. It did. Maybe just not at that time. So he, he, <laughs> Put this off license in what was effectively an old part of the markets area of, of Belfast. And it was right between two areas. One was Protestant, one was Catholic. So both factions would come knock on his door, hold, hold him up with guns, bombs, and demand money with menaces. And so he had, he had three or four bad incidences where he just avoided being seriously hurt. There's on one you told me about. Uh, about oh, the guys with the, with the bomb. The, the ceiling. Please tell us that story. Uh, so great. listeners can get an idea of how extreme this was. So they came in. One had a gun. So he hold, holds my dad up and he says, you know, just don't make any false moves. Don't ring anybody. Don't shout. And he sent the other guy up to plant an incendiary device, which obviously a bottle shop is a great place to plant an incendiary device because you're going to have lots of you're going to have lots of glass flying everywhere. And so he sends him upstairs into the store area. And there's this. And the floor, the ceiling literally comes down near the floor and goes back up again. Really? <laughs> the, the ceiling goes down, it comes back yeah. up. Yeah. Most people never see that in, in their life. I know, it took a. And the, the, the reaction from the floor back up again. So it just. And, and the guy who's holding my dad up says, walk, don't run. <laughs> so the guy upstairs is scuttling out. The incendiary device had gone on under his arm, or gone off under his arm, and it, he, he, he was missing part of his limb. And the other guy grabs him, the two of them make it out onto the street, and they get away. And this guy's like holding his severed yes. arm. Yeah. Blood they spurting. Never caught. Incredible. And this was, this was just one of several incidents. One of several incidents. So, yeah, it wasn't a place to have a successful business in the 70s. It just wasn't possible. Now, how were you getting into horses mm -hmm. while you were living effectively in a war zone in Belfast during the Troubles? What, what, what was happening that you could do that? So it's interesting. You know, my dad had, he has this vision for an amazing place. He wanted to set up a hotel that also had a riding stables along a river in a beautiful place called Newcastle in County Down. And he had bought the hotel. Sale ended up falling through 1974. But he had this vision and he he knew that this was what something that people would love to do. And he said, you know what? You, you would love to be on horses. And at the age of five, I was sent onto the back of this little Shetland pony with my brother and he hated it and he fell off the first day and I loved it and I couldn't get enough of it. And so it was a priority. My dad just went, yeah, do you know what? You're going to do this. So he sent me every week and it, you know, it was one of the, the, it was the light in my life in the maddest of times. It was the thing that kept me going. Right. Because no Belfast else. itself as a city was not so big. So you could get out of it to the countryside relatively quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Really, really easily. And so this craziness is going on where you're living. Yeah. And you need to get away from it. Okay. That makes sense. But it's so, not just so then, going on. It's not just going on where you're living. It's going on around the families that you're living with, mm. the people you're in school with. You know, it may not be happening in your home, but it's happening in their home. It's happening in your family, extended families, lives. It affected everybody. It's a very small area. I mean, we have less than a million people at the time in Northern Ireland and it, over six counties. And so, you know, a dispersed population, very few of them in the city. 
So obviously this is not really a healthy environment if you can possibly get out of it to bring up kids. What did your dad do? How did he handle that dilemma? So in, interestingly, he had, through, through all of this trouble in, in the off license, he'd ended up, one of his bank businesses had gone bankrupt. He was working for other people and it was 1980s, Thatcher government in the UK, lots of economic hardship across the UK. So he had lost a job that he had. And during the day when he was unemployed, he used to go down to the library and look at all of the newspapers that they had for possible jobs. And one of them was for a job on a stud farm in County Tipperary. And he clipped it out, brought it home and he said, oh my goodness, look at this. Wouldn't this be amazing? And on a whim, he applied for the job. It was a job of effectively house manager, butler to an American multimillionaire who ran a stud farm in the most beautiful county in Ireland in Tipperary. And in Southern Ireland, not in Northern Ireland. In Southern Ireland. Away from the troubles. Away from the troubles. And he got the job. And he went down to try it out for a couple of months. And things were escalating. The hunger strikes were ongoing in Belfast at the time. These were political prisoners hunger striking for polit political prisoner status and recognition by the UK, which was not happening. They had been on dirty protests and they had gone on to starvation, a hunger strike. And so tensions were incredibly high. And we couldn't really wait to get out. It was getting closer and closer. My, my parents were really concerned. My older brother was at, you know, he's 13, 14, very vulnerable age. When you're seeing all of this tension around you community wise. And we had arranged to leave in May of 1981. And the day we moved house was the day that Bobby Sands died. One of the uh, main tell us who, yeah, stories. tell us who Bobby Sands was and why that was important. He was one of the main hunger strikers. On the Catholic won, end. On the, yeah, Catholic end. He, he was in the Mays prison and he was protesting peacefully for political prisoner status of recognition that these people were not just, were not criminals that they were there because they were engaged in conflict, that a political conflict with the current regime in the north of Ireland. And it wasn't being recognised. So they'd been arrested. A lot of them had been interned without trial. And then they took things as far as they could. They stopped wearing clothes. They started stopped using toilet facilities. And they smeared their excrement on the walls in the in the the prison in order to highlight their plight. And eventually, the only thing they could resort to was hunger strike. And so they did. And several of them died. And Bobby Sands had stood as an MP for his area. And it was unheard of that a member of Parliament, Parliament of the UK Parliament, would be on hunger strike and then subsequently die from that hunger strike. And it was just insane. The place went up like a tinder cake. Okay, so then it really erupted the violence. I remember this. Because yeah. because bombs are going off. I was brought up in London. Bombs are going off in London at that time as well. I remember We're driving we're driving out of Dodge that <laughs> with all of our stuff on our back, literally. So your dad okay. gets this job yeah. in the South, hundred hundred and fifty miles or more away yeah. from all of this. We leave the day that this all erupts. We're leaving. Okay. leaving As literally town. the buildings are burning around you, you're driving out. It's an interesting, yeah, it was an interesting day. Good Lord. And we arrived to a very rural, very bucolic, South County Tipperary stud farm, you know, three or four miles from any town, all very quiet and very different lifestyle, very different lifestyle. And that's where your horse career really took off. Yeah, absolutely. I had the most amazing luxury of these fantastic people who had stunning horse knowledge and who wanted to pass it on. And this was the Crim Carroll family, amazing family in Tipperary. Me under their wing and taught me everything I know. They were incredible. And I was like a little sponge. I just couldn't wait to learn more and more and more. And yeah, it was a, an amazing education. 
So you then grow up and go through your adolescence, become, get in, into the horse world, become a professional. Something is intriguing me here though. Okay. We've talked about your, your background with conflict and looking for resolution within conflict and perhaps that being something of an instinct because you would have as a kid been having to negotiate that whole system of yeah. in school, in the shops, in family, uh, while all this stuff was going on in Northern Ireland. Then suddenly you find yourself in horse paradise. <laughs> yeah. But something else that I'm di di dictator, detecting rather down in, 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 in what you've been doing within the equine assisted world is there's a system to it. Like you, you identified a problem, which was fragmentation, factionalism, people from one area of therapeutic riding saying, mm, it's not so good to the other people, which I guess if you're coming out of the troubles in Northern Ireland, if you can put it in perspective and say, well, yeah. at least you're not planting incendiary bombs in each other, you know, each other. Yeah, this is small potatoes, guys. You <laughs> right. can get over it yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> I get that. I mean, you use what a useful perspective to come from. And then, but this thing about, you know, looking for the system of, you know, lunging in hand, long reining to, and play to get the, keep the horses happy, yeah. muscled and supple and, and then looking for how to incorporate that into the session. So there's no time conflict. And then looking at, you know, how to create these courses with horse sport Ireland. This mm -hmm. is all very systematic. Where does your systems thinking come from? Oh, <laughs> so interestingly, I know my dad had this amazing idea that I would get to involved in all these horses. He didn't want me doing it as a job. He was like, you know, there's no money in horses. Don't don't ever work with horses. There's no money in it. Unless you have a lot of money to start with, you're going to end up with absolutely no money. You're not going to get paid for the work that you do. And in lots of ways, he wasn't wrong, particularly in Ireland. You know, you, you need to come from money in order to have and continue to have horses successfully over time. It's something that eats at your money rather than earning you money unless you're at the very high end. And then it kind of produces money for itself. So he said to me, look, you know, you're you have a brain like a steel trap. <laughs> it just wants to learn new things. He said, why don't you go to college and do something useful? So I went and I did management. Why that? Oh, you could have done anything. Systematic, very logical. I have a very logical brain. You know me well. Rupert, I love logic. I love maths. I'm a big maths person. And so for me, the appliance of mathematics is structural engineering. And really, that was what I wanted to know. But I'm, I'm also, I'm a problem solver. I, I can't just know one thing. I have to know how that one thing fits in with the next like little cogs and wheels. So engineering was a perfect fit for me. And so not only engineering, but project management within construction was the area I wanted to go for. So you had to learn a little bit about architecture, a little bit, a lot about structural engineering, quantity surveying, finance, economics, maths. You know, you had to, you had to have an overview and I love an overview. <laughs> I'm no good on small picture. I'm all about the big picture. And so that fascinated me. And I learned how systems went together. I learned how reliances worked. You know, if you want something to move along, that you've got to rely on other people to come in and help you out. The best practices around realizing that everything is just a part of a growing wheel. So, you know, nobody's going to be amazing on their own. If I send you out to build a bridge, you know, over a large river and you're one man, no matter what idea you have, you're not going to be able to make that work. You might be, but it's going to take you an awful long time. And so I love the fact that all of these different skills could come together and make everything work much quicker. And yet they kept, you know, they kept professional boundaries. They kept quality control going, a huge part of it. You know, you can't build a building without making sure that everything hits the quality control. and it, all those aspects were respected and valued on site. And I loved working in that direct, in that way, that the T-boy was more important sometimes than the chief engineer, you know, because you can only feed an army on its stomach, like, you know, so it was really important that everybody had their role and it was valued. And I think it's something that I really 
value in my team as well. You know, when I have an amazing team where I work and and they would be an extraordinarily amazing writer and writing instructor in David Moo. But on the other end, you have Lucy Dillon, who is just this incredible horsewoman and a brilliant educator, like an extraordinary educator and a person extraordinarily brilliant and talented at working with children. And everybody brings their strengths and weaknesses to the team and nobody has to do everything. Mm. It doesn't matter if I'm not the best rider or I'm not the best horse person or I'm not the best lunger. We have those skills within the team, so it doesn't really matter. We can pick and choose where it works best. Now, I think you, that's my system's brain. Did you, ha, you got a chance to put this into practice, I presume. Did you go out and work on building sites? and, and Yeah, I did. I, built the, projects? I was involved in the building of a, a bridge over the River Slaney in Enniscorthy in Wexford. So this was a, one of the last ever, I love this, this work. It was one of the last ever cast in situ bridges which meant that we poured the concrete every day. We didn't, didn't just bring in pieces that had been precast elsewhere and went together like Lego. We actually had to do a huge amount of problem solving on site and we had to actually pour the concrete and deal with this active substance on a daily basis. It was fascinating. And I you only have one chance to get it right. Absolutely. And the whole county <laughs> is watching. <laughs> Everybody's on site that day. And every the whole town is watching, so you don't get it wrong. Yeah. yeah um. Right. So then, how did you? Then you, you seem to have moved away from horses. That did you keep horses going as a parallel career? Yeah, I, I, I was trying to move away and go and have this career in engineering, and I kept being dragged back. So I, I, I thought, you know, I miss horses. I might like to ride occasionally at a weekend. Um, that was a hobby. Yeah, I know you're laughing now. And I, I went literally went rang a riding school and I said, "Do you have a ride out on a on a Sunday morning?" And they were like, "Yeah. Do you have much experience?" And I said, "Oh, a little bit, you know." And they said, well, "What kind of experience?" Well, I used to teach, but I, I haven't done it in a while. And and they were like, "Oh, would well, you want to come up and and, and stay for a bit?" <laughs> so I arrived up on the Sunday morning at about ten o'clock and left there like nine o'clock that night and. I was immediately hooked back in. Within weeks, I was leaving my job and going back to horses. <laughs> so my dad's plans went astray and I went back to working with horses. And you went um, into the sport horse industry at that point, I presume. What, what, what yeah, did you do there? Mostly it was riding schools, actually, and teaching riding, riding out, taking trekking in the Phoenix Park in Dublin, which is this amazing, huge park where, you know, it's beautiful on a sunny day. You ride out onto this 15 acre field with people behind you. There are deer in the background. It's all very lovely until you're there in September and the deer are rutting in the little gap that you have to go out into this 15 acres where you exercise your horses and it all becomes a little bit more problematic. <laughs> and you learn a lot in those days and you have to bring new horses on. You, you know, you're having to risk assess People have never been on horses before. The Japanese mm -hmm. tourists were an experience for me. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a group of Japanese tourists. And none of them ever held a rein while they were out the entire time. Uh, we relied on the goodness and kindness of our horses who were amazing. But those kind of experiences show you where the gaps are, particularly mm -hmm. if you have a brain like mine that loves to find out where, where, where the gaps are. What what went wrong and why and how you could redo it a better way? How did you make it safe for these people who never been on horses to go out among all the rutting deer? So yeah, interestingly, and, and and I didn't know as much as I do now, but our horses were really intelligent. Really, they trusted us. We worked with them day in day out, so they trusted the people who worked on the ground for them, and we you know we schooled them out in the in the Phoenix Park when we weren't taking treks. And they would follow nose to tail. They knew not to pass the lead rider or they'd get growled at by the lead rider. <laughs> and they would stay behind us. They were incredibly well trained without having a huge amount of training. Right. And they incredibly well intentioned horses, actually. Now, but you say, okay, this is effectively trekking. But yeah. I, know, I know for a fact that you, you said, for example, that you grew up with the Croom Carroll family. Yeah. 
Yeah. They're, they're an iconic family <laughs> in the Irish horse world. So they, they must have taught you way beyond this. Absolutely. What was the um, education you went through with them? So the very classical, who would have taught me most, was would have been, I think, the first I in Ireland, the BHSI, which is the full instructor level of the BHS exams, British Horse Society exams. And we were just really lucky to not only have that family, but again, they were amazing women who wanted to learn more. And Micklein was never happy with just that's the way it is. She wanted to know why all the time. So if she didn't know, if it was something she didn't know and she couldn't teach me, she would then look outside and she would go and learn it. So she did a lot of classical dressage with a Dutch rider living in Ireland in, around Kilkenny Clomel at the time. Van de Vater was based there. And the Micklem family were down the road and she worked with them. Tell us about and, them. Uh, Who were they? Uh, well, William Micklem is the, the person most people would associate with them now. William is the one of the sons. His dad was an amazing horseman. They were a Dutch family living again outside of Tom Ellen, Cash Tipperary and fantastic horse knowledge. What discipline were they were they in? Mostly dressage and show jumping. Okay. But but you know, really well rounded. I think a lot of the people I was lucky enough to come across at that stage started off as three day eventers. Knew that the whole picture of your horse depended on you know, you wanted to have a horse who could do everything. And who was fit, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And so those were the days of eventing, did roads and tracks. Though, you know, you did, you did steeplechase, roads and tracks. You also did cross country. You did dressage. And your horse had to be supple, collectible, expandable, jump, do everything, speed up, really go fast, come back. You know, so they trained their horses for that work. And they didn't want to just train show jumpers. I think there wasn't a market for pure show jumpers at that stage. Mm. In Ireland, definitely. So they had to produce these really well-rounded horses that would do whatever the market demanded them to do. Mm. So we learned everything. So we, versatility, basically. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we were looking at that time at Irish draft horses and Irish sport horses, which came from the idea of having a horse that would drive you to mass. You could, you know, ride afterwards and it was you know it would also plow your fields and then you go hunting on it at the at, on a saturday absolutely right yeah. and jump on the big bank absolutely bank. Yeah. yeah it had to do everything and that that ethos permeated the entire equine industry here in ireland mm. was don't specialize generalize we're too small to specialize mm. you know so... we need to produce these horses that can do everything so now let's just jump ahead to child vision where you are now. Fitness is a really interesting thing because obviously, you know, for many of us, we'd say, okay, well, that's hill work or that's, you know, a lot of trail riding at the trot, you know, get your horses fit, get them hard fit in the tendons as well. Da, 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 da. Well, you can't really do that where you are. You just, no, just for we for have li- no room. No, <laughs> for listeners who don't know where she is, you think drum chondra in, in Dublin, it's not green fields and leprechauns. If, oh, there might be leprechauns, no. but they're living in, in tower it's blocks. The city center. Right. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the city center of a, of a large European city with a couple of million people in it. So, and it's, it's not the Hyde Park end of a city center. It's right. not the Champs-Élysées end of the city center. No. It is in the real core. Right. It's not the Phoenix class. Park that she was talking about. Yeah. It's, it's, no. Like I say, if there's leprechauns, they're living in tower blocks. Absolutely. How are you keeping it's, your horses fit there? We're we're working them, we're lunging them, we're riding them, we are working them in hand and long reining them. We don't have the space. Everything has to be done on a micro basis. Mm. You know, so you've got to be so they're basically in the gym the whole time. Absolutely. You've got to find the smallest amount of space that you can do the most amount with. So we don't even have, you know, we don't have a gallop track, we don't have yeah, we've had to make do amend. I recently had a visit from a college in Northern Ireland coming down to see what we were doing. And they said, when we talk to you and you tell us about what you do, it, it we thought we were coming to this huge place and you, it's so tiny. It it's like, really yeah. tiny, yeah. It's really tiny. 
So yeah. even within this tiny postage stamp that you've got, I know that you have a trail around a sports field as well, yeah, which you've got to share with the rugby players and the yes, we players do. And, 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 <laughs> but honours today. Yeah, I've seen your horses and they are muscled and magnificent. So would you be available, for example, if there are, if there are people listening saying, well, gosh, you know, I, I don't really have a lot of space. What, what can I do? Would you be able to mentor them in, in a program of fitness, absolutely. lunging and, and that sort of thing that you can use yeah, a small space for? I mean, realistically for, for us, the big key to this was the in-hand work, that yoga. I mean, you know, if you have a bathroom that is only as wide as your arms and as long as your body, you have enough space to do yoga in. And, and we would feel the same about the horses. So the in-hand work, the suppleness work, that all happens in a relatively short space. You don't even need a 20 meter circle to do this work in. You can do it in the yard, you know, up and down between the boxes. We can, we can work in a very small space with this. And actually, sometimes it really helps to work in a small space because it helps the horse to have a direction to move in. But yeah, all that suppling work it's yoga for horses. And so our horses are supple. When they're supple, it's easier. They're building muscle because they're relaxed. There's no tension. There's no stress in the body. And they're able to, they're, they're getting, they're feeling better. So they're feeling like they can move their shoulders a little bit more. They're feeling like they can move their hindquarters a little bit more. When they feel like that and you put them on the lunge, they are starting to but to get that hind leg further underneath them. They're starting to feel good about themselves the way we do when we are more supple and more agile. And you get the same response. They're more willing to take leap to go and, and, and go that extra mile because it feels good. It doesn't feel hard. How do you avoid, I mean, horses still need to get out there and eat grass, you know, yeah. sooner or later. And I, I remember when I was a kid in London, when 500 years ago, there were actually quite a lot of horses in the city then. Rag and bone men, the, 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 all the breweries had drays delivering the barrels of beer, pulled by magnificent teams of shy horses. There were obviously all the police horses, but there were also, like a lot of the old cab drivers came from families that had had, 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 had hackney cabs yeah. and still had a tradition of carriage driving in their spare time and kept their horses in muses, you know, urban stables. Yeah, nope. in the middle so of the city. Interestingly, that, well, that was but the they, they 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 would send their horses out for grazing a certain amount of time in the summer to the yeah. counties. Right? What do you do for your horses for this? Well, but we had the same situation here in in Dublin when I moved into Dublin from Tipperary, and actually the horse industry in Dublin was full of those guys who were carriage drivers, dray drivers. And they, they were some of the first people that I got to know in the city centre, around horses in the city centre. And so when I had this problem of working in a stables in the middle of the city centre, no turnout or very limited turnout, <clears throat> I went, what, how do I get my horses out to grass? And I went back to these guys who, you know, and I said, you know, guys, what, what do you do? What are you doing? And I remembered one, one particular family, the good family, and, and they would always they were big into their horses went out to grass. The minute they weren't being used, they went out to grass. You know, if they weren't interacting with humans, they went out, got downtime, got to be horses away from humans. And so that was, you know, I, I spoke to Ben and Val about this. Ben and Val good. And I said, where who are they? Where can I... Who are Ben and Val good? I, they, these, are, these are the guys that I'd met who were carriage drivers in Dublin city centre. Okay. Val used to drive the Guinness carriage. Ben okay. used to drive the Lord Mayor's carriage. Okay. So they were great men to ask. They were great mentors. And so, you know, they said, go to Meath because that's the place with the best grass nearest to Dublin. And it's the next county up and the soil is fantastic. And that was where they had put their horses. And so we went to Ashburn in Meath and we rented that. It was one of the first things I did when I moved into working in that yard in Child Vision in Dublin because they just didn't have enough grass. Okay. And there was no way I could sit there with these horses and look at them never getting out for really good grass. And how far are these pastures that you rented in County Meath from Drumcondra where in the city centre? They're about 35 kilometres away. 
so it's a sh you know it's it's not even an hour with the horse box, and so we 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 take them out as often as we can. Do you have a sort of a pattern to it that, of rotation? Yeah, we. I mean, we have two weeks in the summer, two weeks at Christmas. We'll go for a week at Easter and a week at Halloween as well, around October, you know, September, October time, and more if it becomes available. If any horse is not doing well, we stop the work and we put them out to grass. If they're for any reason. They're not going to be working. We put them out to grass. So it, it's our default place. It's our rest home. It's our downtime. If we get a long weekend and it's more than just the Monday off, we might have the Friday off as well. Horses go to grass. Okay. So it's, it, it, it's where we possibly can and we'll rotate them as well. So to give one a rest and bring one in so that they're coming in fresh all the time. I had a horse out last week because he just needed some downtime. Mm. He needed to just lie in the sun and be a horse. And he's come back in great form. You know, and a week of that is really good. It's like ourselves when we go on holidays. Mm. You don't necessarily need two months holidays because you enjoy your work. But you do need to get away from it on a regular basis. And yeah. you need to know that you can come back into it. Lots of short breaks rather yeah, than... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that's very, very important. You know, I, I've, I've, in the course of the horse boy work, I've been lucky enough to work with some people who work in urban settings. Obviously, you, a, a great girl, Mandy, in, in Amsterdam, who is in, a again, a very small patch, other, other places. And, of course, they always battle to find the areas outside of the city where they can get to, but all of them prioritized it. And it seems to be, as you say, the magic formula. Obviously, you need all that good type of work you were talking about, but yeah, just for, yeah. for the brain and the, and the nervous system and the gut, you know, just to be able to go out to grass and, as you say, not deal with humans for a bit. <laughs> well, I, I think until they present themselves at the gate and say, "Now I'm ready to come back." Yeah, absolutely. We, we, I mean, we, we mustn't forget our horses work. Mm. They are working horses. Mm. They're not leisure horses. Mm. They do a job, and it's really important that they get downtime like us. They can't. You can't give from an empty cup, and our horses can't give from an empty cup. Mm. So you've got to have that ethos across the board for your team, for your horses. Our horses are our team. So as far as our, we were concerned, it was a no brainer, you know. So, so tell us a little bit more about the work you do at Child Vision with the visually impaired. How is that specific within the equine assisted world? I know you're not only working with that population, but it's, it's a population that I, that I'm intrigued by for many reasons. So talk, talk us through a little bit. Oh, this is my, my, my pet subject. You might not ever get me off this. So, um, yeah, grab a we, bottle of whiskey, we, guys. Yeah, hurry's off. Look, we'll be back in a while. No, uh, we have the most amazing setup because we have preschool children with a visual impairment coming into our service at from the age of 18 months. And 18 so, we months. Can, 18 months, yes. Yeah, so have them up can, on the horse at 18 months. Absolutely, yes. Okay, that's interesting. So, we can. Even for a few minutes. And, and, and remember, at that age, they're physically not able to take a huge amount. And it would only be supported riding. So, Are you riding with them in front of you in the saddle? Absolutely, yeah. back riding. And for a few minutes, just to help encourage head control, you know, body control, all those kind of things. We are so lucky to have this population to work with because it's interesting. None of the children we see are just visually impaired. Nowadays, somebody with just a visual impairment is considered very mainstream. And so the children and adults that we see have visual impairment and another okay. number of issues. So they may have autism, which is the most kind of straightforward group of kids that we would see from our services. They may have cerebral palsy. They may have a number of syndromes associated with premature birth. They may have cortical visual impairment where their eyes are perfect, but their brain can't process the visual information from the eyes. And this is a really interesting one for you, Rupert, because neurologically, the older part of the brain, not the newer part of the brain, is still getting some visual information, that high contrast black and white, even with people with visual impairment, Purkinje cells are still sending signals across the brain, but not in the visual neural pathways that we currently associate with color vision, 
And so how are those, so Purkinje cells for those, Purkinje cells as we should Purkinje call them, cells, yeah. for those people that don't know what those are, those, those are cells produced in the cerebellum mm -hmm. that when you move and problem solve, your brain produces this protein called BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor that makes your brain produce more brain cells. And among yeah. these brain cells are these things called Purkinje cells, which govern motor skills and social skills and act like an internet within the brain. How are those, that's just sort of so people understand what you mean by that. But yeah. my question is, how are those cells, you said those cells are picking up and transferring information through the brain that's visual, but it's not being interpreted by the brain as sight. Vision. How, is, how is the brain interpreting that information? So the, the, the motor pathways and the old kind of contrast, very basic in the, in, in the really old part of the brain, Though that's still, so what we associate with modern sight is all this, you know, rods and cones, this color, high color, high definition vision that we associate with being fully sighted. But there's an older vision right in the back, which is still about, you know, high contrast, black and white. That That is really closely linked with motor pathways. And we're currently looking, we're doing some research at the moment into the effect of rapid movement on vision and orientation because we can move people on a horse much faster than they're ever going to move on their own two feet and it makes them solve problems faster increases their thought process speed and it is giving them new ideas so that it's the, that's just one of my hobby horses on on the end of and it's something that we're working on at the moment a paper we're working on for Denver actually for the vision 2023 conference in Denver in July but so there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities. Vision impairment is a sensory processing issue. If you're having an issue with your vision, you are having an issue with one of your senses. So all of the things that apply for sensory processing issues and autism and ADHD all apply for visual impairment. And so we've got this amazing crossover and we've got people with absolutely no vision cantering on horses and they're oh. able to turn turn the corner independently independently they're not even on the lunch line they are riding independently and cantering these horses and you know their vision would be very very poor in comparison to the main population they might have some light or you know some color maybe but not necessarily the. but they're people. getting they're getting down the road with a stick they're they're sorry what they're getting down the road with a stick. Absolutely. Yeah. They're walking with a cane. So what do you think is allowing these these people to be able to guide their horses so we, through independently asking, in the arena? We've been asking this question, actually, at Orientation and Mobility Conference. Yeah, what do they say? Well, have you asked them? Well, they've come up with loads of ideas. They've come up with this whole idea of echolocation, and they've come up with the idea of, you know, the feedback from the horse. They've, you know... Maybe it, it, they, they're mapping the arena and somehow, but these are people who are not on their own feet. They're not at the same height they're normally at. They're, you know, moving faster than they normally move. Right. So actually, the secret is that this old part of the brain that isn't processing vision as we know it, as they move in space, is telling them about what's coming up. It's giving them a map of the arena. Or of the space that they're in. So, and so they're getting a brain and body map. Yes. That's extending yeah. beyond the horse. Because those of you who know what brain and body maps do, let's say you're holding a pen, your brain creates the pen as part of your body, or the, you go through a doorway and it creates the height between your head and the doorway as part of your body. So you duck yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. But to, to set, to make the whole arena. Yes. Out of a brain and body map. They can map the whole place. Do you so think that this is therefore like a bit of a superpower that you might absolutely. get if you're visually impaired because you've got to overcompensate in another way? Because I, I can't map the whole arena. Well, and I these spend are my, my life magnets. riding in arenas. I don't map well, the whole my, my circle's so always shit. You know? <laughs> these, are, these are called magnocellular pathways. Magnocellular pathways. pathways magnocellular brain. pathways. Tell us about these, please. I, 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 I'm currently in my research mode. 
and I, I am coming back with more. But I spoke to an ophthalmologist today and she said, oh, yes, the magnocellular pathways in the brain are along the movement pathways. They go back into that ancient part of the brain and they're giving an impression of what's in front of that person. So it's not vision as such, but it is an impression of where things are in space around. Them. Okay. So That's it's fascinating, fascinating for me. Absolutely. Um, but but yes, and it, that BDNF, the more you create the BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophic factor, the more you grow those brain cells, the more information they're getting, the more they come across this, their thought processes are just getting faster and faster. It's like learning to drive a car. Because when you get in first, you're like, oh, everything's coming up on me so quickly. And then you're like, oh, faster, faster, going on motorways, you're fine. You know, you get become used to it. You never step back that pace. You mm. never unlearn thinking at that speed. Mm. So if we can put them on the horse, they learn to think faster than they have previously. So optimal, optimal cognitive function, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Horse is moving at 24 kilometers an hour at canter. They're moving at two and a half to three kilometers an hour on their feet. Mm. This is 10 times the speed. Mm. Sorry, it's just a and that, that, well, yeah, it's what, so what, fascinating to what, me. What, what, what's fascinating to me there too is that, well, obviously, if it's a car, if it's a machine, it does your bidding. Yes. A horse, of course, has many variables. It's going to take that corner differently depending yes. on your body weight, depending on if it sees a bird over there, depending on if there's the, the, how the ground is, uh, any number of factors. So you yes. could do 10 circles. And each of those circles, presumably, if you're visually impaired, could feel very, very different. Yet you can map that circle time after time on an animal that is reacting itself to that circle. To the dis- circle, yes. What's going on there? Is that more BDNF? <laughs> what's, what's that? It's, it's, it's something that's still under research that we're looking at at the moment. But it's, ah, it's just a joy to look at. And what we're, we're seeing is that, you know, when somebody is on the back of the horse, part of their body is supported. So, you know, if you're visually impaired, you spend a lot of your concentration on keeping your body upright in space. Mm. Just moving one foot in front of the other is a difficult. Right, rig- this is on foot, not even on, before you even think about a horse. No, but if you take away some of that concentration, the horse is supporting you from the waist down. Mm. You've got more brain power to think about other things. This makes sense. And I guess something that sprang to mind while you were talking there, you know, we all, those of us who ride all sort of aspire to to that centaur feeling, you know, and sometimes we we really have it where it feels like our, our own legs sort of basically become the front legs of the horse. And, you know, we're really at that optimal melding, shape shifting, really, you know, and of course, one of the ways many of us who teach riding get people to do that is by telling them to shut their eyes, right? You know, go down the long side, take a certain number of steps with your eyes shut. You always, your feel improves. Do you yeah, think yeah. that if, if these people are riding effectively with their eyes shut the whole time? Well, one of the things then... that stops us from realizing our dream of being centaurs is that we open our eyes and we look and we see that we're not part of okay. the horse. Okay. You know, so there's, there's that visual aspect of, you're sitting and suddenly you're moving through space. Your body is moving through space elegantly and beautifully. And you don't have this visual uh, signal to say, it's not all you. That's brilliant, Terry. That's something I hadn't considered at all. So perhaps the visually impaired experience of riding a horse is truer to what we're all seeking I, than I the so. visually i hope so That's, they love that, it <laughs> what, what a what a what a joyful it is a joyful thing. concept i mean That's i just feel my heart lifting as you say that so yes i have the best job <laughs> no. and we can start them from when they're quite small so we can give them this experience right so yes and if someone starts very with very this at 18 strange. months and then is doing this from oh, there so. by the time they're 20 it's just there. So, and, and do you really observe a, because I know you've been there seven years yeah. now, so you've pr- presumably seen some kids go from, you know, through that seven year trajectory with you. Yeah. 
what have you observed in their cognitive function of that time? They are, I mean, I, so the, the difficulty is because I see all of our children as being bright and beautiful and amazing sure. and, and, and having their own tongue. But you do see huge leaps actually in cognitive function in their ability to interact with you and they're wanting to interact, follow instructions concept in the, of them. In their academic life in the school away from? Absolutely. So, I mean, we would work towards sort, sort of things, pattern recognition, academics, always working towards that end of things. So yes, we can and we do do academics with some of our children on the back of the horse. But it's all around, initially it's all often around concept development. With visual impairment, concept development is even harder than it is for somebody with autism. So, you know, what are you sitting on? I have no idea. I can't see this horse. <laughs> so we work on concept development around everything, you know, where they are, what the field looks like, how trees are. They can feel them. They can touch them. They can reach up. Yeah. So we work a lot on concept development initially with them. And then we work around movement and then on to academics. And all. When you're teaching academics, okay, so let's say your concept development is good and they're now understanding the environment they're working in and what they're on and the brain is developing. Could you give us an example of how you would do an academic exercise? In the so we, very simple because, you know, we, we're a small charity. We don't have massive events. We're not an international charity, say, for example. So funding is not enormous. So we, we have to find really interesting ways of doing things. And one of the things we found are foam dice are an amazing tool. And we hide them in our trail, in boxes, and we get the children to collect them, find them. And then we might throw the dice and the sum of the dice might be the number that, uh, of steps that we taught for. Or it might be a multiple of the number on the oh, dice. Oh, so they, they, would, they would take the foam dice, throw it. Can they, feel, can they feel the, the dots on it? Can they feel... Vis is it a bit like Braille? Can they feel the dots of the we, numbers? We have we have wooden ones that have holes. Yeah, that have holes in, so that they can use those visually impaired. Okay, so, use those, but we, yeah. so then they would throw it. Yeah, a number would they would feel that number, we and then put the horse the into number. that number of trot steps. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a sort of cellular way of becoming. A, what would you then do with that? How would you then turn that into arithmetic? So we might say if. We, if we're doing it in groups, there might be two people with five. So we've gone for five and we might say, well, we'll add the second five steps on to the first five. So we might say, right, we're going to trot for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Five and five more is ten. So we might, we might do it that way. We might work on getting them to, you know, add the, subtract one from the other depending on what we're working on that day we'll make it very physical we'll make it very practical so that could, you, could you could you take it beyond addition and subtraction could you take it to multiplication and division absolutely, absolutely. how two would you do that five is ten. two times five is ten so okay we've got two of you so we've had five and five that's two times five okay so how are we gonna and then if we were to take five away from what we did we'd have only gone for trot we'd have only trotted one time for that first five so 10 minus five is five, you know, so we would, in, in that way, we develop those concepts over time. And all of that is being felt through the body. Completely. And mm. it's much more motivational. They're getting all of that oxytocin. They're getting that lovely movement and they're having fun. They're getting proprioceptive feedback. They get everything's involved. Their vestibular systems activated because they're moving and, and they're moving in a rapid movement on the back of the horse. There. What what you're really doing there, what you're really talking about, it seems, is applied neuroscience. Absolutely, yeah. That just happens to be four legs. It is applied neuroscience. <laughs> As a systems girl, I need to be working with the main computer. You know, <laughs> 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 everything else comes from that. Let's make that the the center of where you're going to work from. Yeah, it's fascinating. If you were giving advice to somebody starting up now in the therapeutic writing world or somebody who was had been in it for a while yeah, but yeah. was looking for new horizons you're obviously developing all of this yeah. what would your first advice be my first advice is be professional 
think about the best practice that you can achieve within whatever space you're in. It doesn't matter if you have 50 horses or you have two horses. Do the very best that you can at every aspect that you can afford to do. So for me, you know, I like to learn about everything. I'm, I just like, I love knowledge. I, I'm curious. I want to know, am I doing the right thing? And if I'm not, is there something better? What makes it better? Why is it better? How can I improve what I'm doing? Because we develop as humans and we want to always, there's no point, isn't what they say about failure is doing the same thing you know, time after time and never learning from your mistakes. Well, that's insanity, actually. I think it's what they said. True. But, you know, so for me, it's about what can I learn in this situation? Stay curious. Always stay curious. Mm -hmm. And then go and find the mentorship that you need. That's... Uh, go ahead. I didn't yeah. want to interrupt you there. So, so, so just never just say, oh, I don't know how to get that information. Ask the people who are doing it. Because if they're anything like me, I will happily tell you forever. So, you know, just go and ask. People really want, if they're doing something well, they want to share that information. If they're doing something poorly, they'll want to hide it. Wow. So if, if they're doing something well, they want the world to know about it. You know, so they will happily tell you. I've never met somebody who does a really good job who's not happy to say, do you want to learn? Mm. And it may be you have to spend three months doing it this way or you spend a year doing it this way to learn. You give your time or you give your money or whatever it is that makes it work. Find the mentorship. Go and find the people who can do it. That seems to me the key word about that's run through your whole thing here is mentorship, right? So you were mentored by the Croom Carroll family. Mm -hmm. uh, you absorbed all that yeah. good equine practice. Then when you were getting into system stuff, you went to be mentored in that mechanical engineering. You went, when you got into the therapeutic riding side, you went off for mentorship yeah. for some years. And then now you offer mentorship. Absolutely. I think, I think one of the, the problems in the, in the horse world, frankly, is lack of curiosity and people being afraid to be judged as a beginner whereas of yeah. course one it always is a beginner whenever one learns a new skill set yes. so therefore don't go learn a new skill set just defend forever what you do rather aggressively and be really grumpy about it if anyone suggests any change and, and scare them off you know absolutely and, and that has traditionally been the mindset here but for me Mentorship doesn't just come from experts. And I have had amazing mentors in my life. John Watson, who was an Olympic rider, I got to work with him when I was a very small child. He used to do pony club rallies. I mean, you know, but fantastic mentorship. But it isn't always these people with this huge knowledge up here. I get mentorship every day from my colleagues. Mm. Mm. I get mentorship from the kids that I see. Mm. If you're curious, you will find mentorship everywhere you go. Are you actively asking your children for their feedback? What do you think? Yes. What could we improve? What's uh, working, what's not working? Rather than ask our shut parents. up and put this, throw this dice so that we can <laughs> do the second time. Yeah. No, what do you want to do? We give them of the autonomy. We ask them where they want to go with this. Because it's not about us. This This whole thing is not about it doesn't matter if I go out there every day and it's about me, then nobody else benefits. I can't benefit anybody else unless I give, get their feedback, unless I ask them how they want to do this, because it's not about me. It's not about my experience of equine assisted therapy or any interaction with the horse. It's about, I ask my horses what they want to do. You know, so I, I, I need to be not the center of this situation i need to ask what is best for you how am i best serving you if i'm not serving them i'm not doing my job mm -hmm. i am not there to be served yeah if something's 
not working, what can I change? Yes. Rather than it's the the fault of that person or it's the fault of that horse. It's no, it's never. It's we need to change something in the situation. It's not something is wrong or somebody has done something wrong. It is just we need a change. And people, I, I'm not great with change. I'm not always brilliant with change. None people of us aren't are. great with change, but yeah. I've found that change is what works. If again, you know, repeating the same mistake over and over again, it's it's no good for anybody. So you know, there are amazing people out there, and I'm really lucky. In and I work in an organization where people have lots of different skills. And I don't have to have their skills. I can just go to the people who have them and say, what do I do now? How so do you're, do you're going to occupational therapists, you're going to physical therapists, you're going to... Speech and language therapists, O&M specialists, orientation and mobility specialists, disability specialists, nursing staff. We have nursing staff on campus, which is incredible godsend. But even in terms of research, I have library staff. I have HR staff. I'm very lucky. I have an unusual situation. Because all of the things that you would want to have as a business, if you're setting this up, I actually have, and I have lots of expertise in that, in other areas within the building that I work in. And I don't have to do all of that. And yes, I have run my own yards and had to be, you know, chief washing, bucket cleaner, everybody. I I did all the jobs, you know, where you're, you're mucking out, you're answering the phone, you're teaching the lessons, you're pulling the mains, you're doing everything. I, I've, I've done that end of things and it's not joyful. Mm. It's not joyful when you, everything comes on, falls on one person. It is joyful to work in harmony with others. Tribe. Whether it's, yeah. Tribal. Exactly. Extended family. Yeah. Clan. Yeah. And I, that's I, where the joy comes. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, th- I think that that's always a central theme here is that if you're, it, if you're not having well-being if the horse is not having well-being how can you and the horse transmit well-being to some someone else you ha- it's not possible it's right? impossible and it, you're so right that that the team tribe call it what you will aspect of it brings joy because that's of course how humans are supposed to to be but yes. you, we know so many people in the horse industry exist in isolation it's just me in my yard doing my thing i don't want any outside interference i don't want and this is certainly true in the therapeutic world. But it's just fear. It's mm. just fear. We, I think particularly in the horse industry, there's an awful lot of cases of imposter syndrome. Mm. So we hide what we don't know under a facade of bluff mm. and, 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 and brusqueness mm. rather than saying, actually, can you show me how that works? Right. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's a sickness within, yeah. it, obviously it's not just the horse world. One, one no, point. it's everywhere. No. It's, it's somehow particularly a little bit in the horse world. And one of the things I, I find fascinating about you, Terry, is that you, you're one of those few people I've run across there who just go into this forever student mode. Uh, because you could say, look, I'm working for this really cutting edge organization, Child Vision in Dublin. We're doing a fantastic job. We really know, I think, I know that you're getting invited to conferences around the world. I know you just got back from Warsaw. I know you're off to Colorado, as you just said, to present in Denver. Denver, there's a neuroscience conference coming up next year in, in Virginia, which I know you're going to be invited to. So, you know, you're, you're in demand. So you could rest on those laurels, but you don't. You, you still go out and look. Yeah. <laughs> So my brain needs input all the time. I have that brain needs constant, you know, it needs to problem solve. I need my vestibular problem solving brain needs input all the time. And I love to solve problems. A pattern recognition is my, it's my little, it's my specialist area of interest. So so, so tell us, how can people get in contact with you? How can they find out more about your work? Okay, so I'm I'm working in Child Vision in Drumcondra in Dublin, and anybody is welcome to drop in Monday to Friday, nine till five, into our yard and say hello. We're so they could just the they could just Google Child Vision as one word. Dot Absolutely. Dot ie. Childvision.ie, and they can rock up on the campus. It's open to the public 
all all year round and we'll be there. So on a very physical level, you can get your ass into Child Vision and, and we'll be there. And on an internet level, you can find me at terry at equi.com. So E-Q-U-I-G-E-E-K.com or Terry Brosnan at childvision.ie. Just repeat um, those a couple of times so people run off and get their pens. Just yeah, so it's say them the, slowly so people can write them down. The Irish disease of speaking really quickly. So it's Terry Brosnan, T-E-R-R-I-B-R-O-S-N-A-N at childvision.ie. That's C-H-I-L-D-V-I-S-I-O-N dot I-E. Or Terry, T-E-R-R-I at Equiki, E-Q-U-I-G-E-E-K dot com. Alternatively, you will be able to get me at Terry at horse dot IE in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. So I will answer emails. If you send them through to me, I'll answer any questions or I will put you in touch with somebody who knows more about this than I do. But specifically for people who are interested in, in this course that you're doing for equine professionals wanting to look yeah. at the, the various ways of getting involved in the therapeutic world professionally. I yeah, could yeah. imagine that this goes beyond Ireland, that if people from other countries wanted to look at the model that you've produced and look at some, doing something similar, can they get with you and talk with you about that? Can they book themselves on one of your courses? Absolutely. We will have a course coming up at the very end of August, beginning of September in Dublin, in Child Vision. There will be a four-day therapeutic riding coaching course on the last week of August into the first week in September. It's the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of that week. And we, there will be one in Northern Ireland, in Caffrey, in Inniskillen, in the college, the Agricultural and Equine College in Enniskillen, sometime over Halloween holidays. I haven't got exact dates yet, but there's, there's definitely one coming up in Northern Ireland for that day. Okay. And obviously I'm going to say, because the internet is timeless, this is 2023 we're talking about. Yep. If you're listening to this in later time frames, just contact Terry for Absolutely. when there's and, going to be And more. we'll continue to run these courses uh, for as long as Horse Board Ireland will continue to fund us. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, listen, Terry, it's been an absolute treat to Thanks check in with you. The work you're doing is stonking, as we say. <laughs> in the and it gives me great gladness because as a dad of an autistic child who found his way through horses, but in a non-conventional way, I just know that with people like you out there doing this sort of thing, it's going to be more kids like mine helped. And this makes me happy. I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in. Please do contact Terry directly. She really will yes. get back to you. She will help you. I've, I've seen her do this time and time again. It doesn't matter if you're in the USA or Japan, she can help you, particularly if you're trying to put something together in a smaller space, particularly if you're looking at how to look at all these various apparently conflicting modalities within the, the therapeutic horse world. How do you marry them all together? She's the lady to talk to. If you're interested in what we do at Horseboy, please go to ntls.co, ntls.co, that's for New Trails Learning Systems. That's Horseboy Method, Movement Method, and Athena, which is our trauma-based modality. Or if you're interested in the horse training and personal development, Go to longridehome.com and you'll find us there. And please tune in for the next equine assisted world. As you can see with Terry here, the people that are coming on this are, are doing extraordinary work that we all need to know about. I have one last little sneaky question. Yes. Okay. You, and I, I'm sure everyone was wondering this. Your surname is Brosnan and you're yes. Irish and you're living yes. in County Meath. Yes. We to know that. Piers Brosnan. <laughs> Piers Brosnan is a Navan man, right? I believe. He yes. Helped. Right. Any, yeah. Any relation? Are you a relation? Yes. They're all actually Kerry men. Ah. Um, and apparently there was a family feud about a hundred years ago over a farm somewhere in Kerry. 
On the other side of Ireland. On the other side of Ireland. So our side of the family doesn't actually know his side of the family uh, for some bizarre reason. But apparently he's a lovely man. And yes, his family are from just up here. So okay, yeah. so what that really means, uh, listeners, is if you get in touch with Terry, she'll sort you out with a date with Pierce. So excellent. <laughs> all, all the more oh, reason to, to contact. <laughs> I, I'm only married to his lovely cousin. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Niall and Niall Brosnan, for those who don't know, Terry's husband is a very, very lovely man. He's what you would really call a polymer. Computers, mathematics, music. Brilliant man. If you ever find yourself lucky enough to be around a table with that man with a glass of whiskey um, <laughs> in Terry's kitchen. So, so if you sign up on one of Terry's courses, you might find yourself in that situation. You may well find yourself in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, thank you. It's been so Oh, fun. thank you so thank much. You much. All right. I can't wait till the next you. time. Okay. okay. Talk to you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join our website, newtrailslearning.com to check out our online courses and live workshops in Horseboy Method, Movement Method, and Athena. These evidence-based programs have helped children, veterans, and people dealing with trauma around the world. We also offer a horse training program and self-care program for riders on longridehome.com. These include easy-to-do online courses and tutorials that bring you and your horse joy. For an overview of all shows and programs, go to rupertisaacson.com. See you on the next show. And please remember to press subscribe and share.